Cultural and Political Ecology Group of the Association of American Geographers. And he's been a wonderful mentor to me there and here. He's included me in a lot of conversations about the future of political ecology and these kinds of questions that he's going to talk about today. So welcome, Bill. We're honored to have you here. Thank you. So thank you very much, Valentin, for that gracious introduction. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Um, and in addition to acknowledging Valentin, I also wanted to, to thank uh, Rachel Sherman. And, um, the two of them invited me to, to give this talk. Um, I, I thought um, I might start by giving you some insight into the genesis of this presentation and a related paper and how I became interested in this um, topic. And it really evolved out of two particular moments. Okay? So, um, the, the first moment is depicted by this image, um, which is an image of the China Import and Export Ex Exposition in Hangzhou, China. Um, and it's an area I visited uh, in August of 2010. And I spent some time uh, at the exposition, and I walked through the hall, and I met an exhibitor from a Chinese company called Wang Lung Pin High Tech Agriculture. Um, which I subsequ subsequently learned was heavily involved in providing uh, technical expertise to a number of agricultural product, uh, projects in Sub-Saharan Africa. And what I found especially interesting in my conversation uh, with this gentleman who was fluent uh, in English um, is the particular narrative that he shared with me. And this is a paraphrase of that narrative. Um, but he, he explained to me that uh, the African continent was underpopulated, that it was land rich, um, and that Chinese firms were in an excellent position to bring a green revolution to Africa. Um, and then he talked a lot about China's particular experience, uh, that it had faced famine in the past, and that it had overcome these problems in the 1970s and 80s. So that experience could be transferred to uh, the African continent. So that's one particular moment, that moment that led to this paper. The other moment was in 2009. Um, I, I went back to Bamako, Mali. This is an area where I've been working on and off for about 25 years. I hadn't been there for five years. Um, and so I set foot in the capital city of Bamako, um, and I was just uh, amazed by the amount of construction that was going on, and in particular, the number of uh, Chinese uh, firms that were engaged in these construction efforts. So a number of new buildings were going up. Uh, they were building a brand new bridge across the Niger River there. Um, and what, what I found quite interesting, and I was there, I was doing research on um, the aftermath of the 2008 global food crisis, so I was interviewing urban households, and you would get off into these out of the way back neighborhoods, and you would find small Chinese businesses there. You know, restaurants, brothels, you name it, okay? So what was interesting to me is that with these big uh, development initiatives, Chinese development initi initiatives, which were using the Chinese private sector to implement them, you had a lot of Chinese, uh, kind of peripheral Chinese private sector operators that were also there and were kind of setting up shop independently of the Chinese government in Bamako. So that's, that's, um, that's really what got me interested in this particular topic. Um, so in this talk, I want to explore um, the, the fact that uh, China's Green Revolution experience, uh, experience has been held up as a success story. Um, that the experience of this agricultural Asian tiger has been used intermittently over the past 40 years as a kind of shining counter example to what's been going on uh, in agricultural development on the African uh, continent. And then how really since uh, 2008 and the aftermath of the, of, the, of the global food crisis, that this just discourse has been resurgent, okay? That we're even seeing more prominent use of the, the Chinese example than we had before, okay? So that's the purpose of the paper as, as, as I outlined above. 
And I'm going to deal with this in kind of three pieces. Okay, so I want to critically look at this Chinese Green Revolution narrative. Then I want to look at how it's being deployed in the African context. And then I want to look at some specific agricultural development initiatives and how they're being supported or undermined by this particular initiative. Okay? So I want to be very clear that I am not a China specialist. I'm an Africanist. Um, but I'm very intrigued by this influence of, of, of China in Africa, particularly in the realm of agriculture. Okay? I would also note that this is a work in progress, the paper, so I'm very keen to, to get feedback. Okay? This is not a, 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 finished, a finished product. So what is the nature of the Chinese Green Revolution narrative? And I think um, while we could go back further in history, and there have been recurrent famines. Um, the most recent and most dramatic one was China's Great Famine of 1958 to 1961, which reportedly killed 36 million people, which is just astounding. Okay? Um, and this was a, a, a seminal moment for the PRC. There are debates about whether this famine was human-caused or natural-caused. Um, but, you know, even irrespective of those debates, okay, from that period moving forward, food self-sufficiency becomes a major priority for the government of the People's Republic. Um, and China responded in a couple of different ways, okay. First of all, it's determined to become food self-sufficient. And initially, it's, it's, it has a dual approach, okay. One is a green revolution approach patterned after what is happening or what is being spearheaded by Western countries in the 60s and 70s. But also, initi initially, it has an agroecological approach, this kind of biointensive approach. So there's, there's this piece, how do we increase uh, agricultural production? But then secondly, um, and this doesn't um, become aggressively enforced or, or put into place until the uh, late 1970s, it's the one-child policy. So to uh, rein in population growth. Okay? Um, I think China's opening up to the world, um, and you know, this is often um, um, most clear in our minds with Nixon's visit in, in, to China in 1972, that opening up influenced the path that China eventually took in terms of agriculture. Um, and one of the first types of exchanges that occurs after that, that Nixon visit is the exchange of Green Revolution technology with the West. Um, and in particular, uh, China ordered 13 of the largest, most modern American design nitrogen fertilizer plants. Okay? And more were subsequently purchased. And so then China becomes the world's largest producer of nitrogen fertilizers which are being used in combination with uh, hybrid seeds to boost uh, yields and production. And this, this biointensive path, which had, uh, was being explored up until that point, is more or less left to the wayside. Okay? So this, this is a, a critical moment. The next um, critical moment is um, a series of changes which occur after Mao Zedong's death. Um, so you have a reformist faction of the Communist Party uh, which comes into power in 1979 um, and they begin to implement a series of changes in the agricultural sector. So agriculture is decollectivized, it's decentralized, and you have the introduction of what they call the household responsibility system. So you still have a quota that you need to fill and provide to the state. But then if you exceed that quota, you're, you're, the production is, is that of the households. They can do with it what they want. They can consume it. They can sell it. Okay? And people are also granted individual tenure rights. It's not private tenure like we're used to in the West, but it's usufruct rights. Households have secure use rights to that land. So instead of collectivized production, it's individual household production. Um, and also there's a policy of, um, you know, increasing uh, kind of free market approach to pricing so that producer prices 
rise for, for what people are producing. Okay? So um, this um, set of reforms, okay, in combination with the use of new green revolution technology, is argued is what led to an astronomical rise in agricultural production in the Chinese con continent. So by 1984, food rationing is lifted. Okay, uh, China has a per capita uh, food supply by the 80s that is close to what Japan has, so a very kind of comfortable uh, mean situation. And this is just uh, some uh, information. This is uh, provided by USDA. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm not going to point too much here, but you see through the 70s, 80s, and 90s uh, increasing production um, both of grains and of oil seeds, okay? which again are linked back to uh, this, this series of reforms. Okay? So this particular approach okay, um, and this success in the agricultural sector is argued by other scholars as well, um, Gulati and Fon, for example, um, that this success in the agricultural sector leads to subsequent success in terms of industrialization. Okay? So it's called the firing from the bottom strategy. So you have to develop your agricultural sector before you can um, uh, become successful at industrialization. Um, and uh, this, if I look at this particular table, reminds me a lot of Rostow's modernization theory, his stages of economic growth, that you go from subsistence to commercial agriculture, and that surplus allows you to, to invest in industrialization. Um, but people are also arguing that developing agriculture is really key for reducing poverty. Um, and some work suggests that uh, the, the growth in agriculture um, contributed to poverty reduction four times as much as the subsequent um, increase in manufacturing did. So because of this success, okay, um, the Chinese example is often um, used uh, to promote the Green Revolution approach. And this is not new. Okay? So uh, Norman Borlaug, uh, the, the grandfather of the Green Revolution, has um, uh, for many years prior to his death was using China as this great success story. So this is not something new. So he writes, you know, since 1980, Ch 1980 China has been the greatest success story. Home to one-fifth of the world's people, China today is the world's biggest food producer. With each successive year, its cereal crop yields approach that of the United States. So that's one story of what happened in China. Um, and what was fascinating for me is to start to dig into the literature um, about an alternate story of what happened in China. And one of the most interesting and compelling uh, scholars that I've interacted with and read his material is Joshua Muldaven, who's a geographer at Sarah Lawrence. Um, he's a, a, a student of Michael Watts, if some of you know his work. But he has a very interesting background because his parents were Russian Bolsheviks who immigrated to China and were um, spent a, a good part of their lives on communes in China. And Joshua, because of this family connection, has also spent a lot of time, a, a, lot, a lot of time on communes. Um, so he has this kind of deep, deep, deep. Um, kind of family connection to China. And I think he's doing, I think he's one of the foremost scholars on uh, kind of agrarian change in, in the Chinese uh, context. Um, so he has a different story of what's, what happened, OK? Um, and he argues that this surge in production that we saw in China in the, from the late 1970s and in the 80s was not necessarily related to these, these sets of reforms, OK? He argues that there were a set of, of assets that were built up during the collectivization period, okay? Investments in the land, as well as the construction of fertilizer plants, okay? 
And then at the moment of these reforms, not only did those fertilizer plants come on stream, in addition to this imported American technology, but also the, the, these collective assets, in a sense, are pillaged during the free market period. And that, for him, is what leads to this, this um, uh, surge in, in, in production. Okay? And then if you look more recently at the production data, okay, so uh, production is increasing until the 90s, but from the late 90s moving forward, it has, it has more or less plateaued. Okay, there is some fluctuation, but it has, has more or less plateaued. Um, so, Moldavan argues, and this is backed up by, um, you know, field work and soil analysis, he argues that this plateauing is related to declining yields, which are related to um, many years of overuse of chemical fertilizers. And some of you may be soil scientists, but if you heavily use chemical fertilizers <coughs> without organic inputs, it leads to a problem known as soil acidification, which, which depresses your yield. Okay. So he's arguing that it's these declines which are leading to the plateauing of agricultural production in China, as well as it's related to the loss of land due to urbanization. So you are taking some very productive land out of, out of, of production as well. So this is a problem for China, okay? Its, its production has plateaued, yet consumption continues to increase. And the increases in consumption are not so much related to population growth, but to urbanization. So as China is urbanizing, diets are changing, and that's putting more pressure on uh, the agricultural sector. So how is this um, narrative of what happened in the China, Chinese experience uh, being deployed in the African context. Okay. Um, and what I find very, very interesting is that it's now being more aggressively applied post-2008, post-global food crisis. Um, so it's, it's resurgent, okay, even though this had been done before. Okay. So this is a quote from a report of published by IFPRI, which is the International Food Policy Research Institute in 2010, um, and quote, the model of agriculture applied by the People's Republic of China during the last 30 years is an example that the poorest countries in Sub-Saharan Africa should follow in their quest for development and growth to eradicate poverty. Okay? Um, so Western institutions, Western think tanks are using this Chinese example in arguing that Sub-Saharan Africa should be doing what China did, okay? Both to increase agricultural production and that this is also the secret to economic growth, that you have to focus on agriculture before you can focus on industry, okay? Now, the Chinese as well, okay? So it's not just the West that are using the example, but the Chinese as well are using their own example, okay? And encouraging those in sub-Saharan Africa to, to, to follow their model. So this is a quote um, from the governor of the Chinese Development Bank uh, from 2008. Uh, this was at a meeting of African finance ministers in Mauritania. China's Development Bank is anxious to work in the area of agriculture given the current scenario of food shortage um, and food price hikes. I believe African countries should put agricultural development at the top of their priority. So this, this is being uh, supported. One of the foremost uh, Africanist scholars in, in, in the Chinese academy is a guy named Professor Li Anshin, um, who works on agriculture, and he's head of the, the uh, African Studies Unit at Beijing University. So here he's saying Africans desperately need to modernize their agriculture both to ensure their food security and to earn hard currency by supporting it. China needs to deal with its growing food demand and Africa needs, uh, seems to offer the solution. So here there's a, a, an additional nuance, okay? Not only should Africa focus on increasing its agricultural production, but there's a synergy here with Chinese needs, okay? That, uh, China needs to find new sources for food given its own plateauing of agricultural production 
and Africa is a logical place to, 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 to focus one's efforts. So which approaches okay, are being supported by this particular narrative in the African context and which are being undermined? Okay? And in order to do that, I want to give you just a brief kind of historical summary of Chinese aid over the past 50 years in the African context to get us up to the, the, the current moment. Okay? Um, so just um, uh, kind of the, the, the general overview, okay? China has been active uh, on the African continent for the past 50 years, basically since African countries got independence, uh, many of them did in the 60s, and they've worked in 44 different African countries. Okay. If you look at aid that was given between 1960 and 2006, approximately 20% of the Chinese projects were focused on agriculture. So there's this long-standing interest in agriculture. Okay. And just for comparison, you can compare this to what U.S. Uh, foreign assistance has been focused on. The U.S. has worked in 47 African countries, so not that different than China. Um, but about 5% of our, our projects have been focused on agriculture. Okay, so more a significant proportion of China's projects have been focused on agriculture than the U.S. Okay. So I'm going to kind of quickly go through each decade here. And the main point I want to make is that the way China was giving assistance, okay, evolves and changes over the decades, but it often mirrors what's going on inside China, okay? So if we look at the 1960s, um, China has, first of all, agriculture is very big, okay, just like it was in the Chinese context following the famine of 58-61. Um, but what's being supported are large state-run agricultural projects, okay? Um, collective farms, very similar to what's going on inside China. Okay? The other thing to keep in mind, in the 1960s, there's a diplomatic war going on with Taiwan. Um, and both entities want to be recognized uh, by the UN um, <coughs> as countries. So Taiwan had a huge development effort in Africa in order to curry favor um, to, to you know, hopefully uh, win a potential UN vote. So for example, uh, Taiwanese aid peaks in 1968. Taiwan had over 1,200 agricultural experts in, China, in Africa at the time working in 25 different countries. Okay? And what's interesting about Taiwan is that Taiwan has a different approach than um, the PRC does. Uh, the, the Taiwanese are focusing on small and medium-sized rice and vegetable producers. Okay, so not big collectivized efforts, okay? Um, but the Chinese are, are, are seeking to counter this, and very often inside the same country, you're going to have Chinese aid vying with Taiwanese aid. So this is, uh, just to give you a, a graphic of this, this is um, um, the Gambia, which is a um, very small country which follows the Gambia River in West Africa. And this is a map of different uh, rice projects supported by the PRC, the Taiwanese, and, and then the World Bank. This is from Judy Carney's work on, on the Gambia. Um, so things begin to change in the 70s, because in 1971, the PRC gets the China seat in the UN. So Taiwan effectively loses that diplomatic war and begins uh, pulling out of the African continent. So many of these... Taiwanese projects, when the Taiwanese leave, they actually revert to the PRC. And um, I think the Taiwanese approach begins to influence um, the Chinese approach, okay? So they start to move away from the large-scale collective projects, okay? But then also remember that things were beginning to change in China then as well. First with Nixon's visit and the subsequent big push on the kind of Western model of the Green Revolution. So many of these projects in the 70s and 80s have a heavy kind of first Green Revolution focus to them, okay? Um, but also as by the late 70s, when China's beginning to rethink its own agricultural strategy and moving to decollectivization, you're also seeing the shift to a focus on smaller farms in the African context. 
and less of a focus on um, uh, uh, collectivization. And then in the 90s and the 2000s, um, as this free market approach becomes um, more present in the Chinese context, I think you also begin to see more of this in terms of aid. Okay? So there's a lot of concern about how sustainable are these projects in the African context that the Chinese had been supporting. There were attempts to hand over a number of them uh, in the 80s, and after the Chinese pulled out, they, they, they were not sustained by uh, local African governments. Um, and so China, in its, in its um, aid initiatives, begins to experiment, okay? And so there's a lot of um, work with public-private um, partnerships. So the Chinese government may be focusing development initiatives, but increasingly a lot of the implementers are private Chinese firms. Um, and there's close coordination be going on between um, the, the, the Chinese government and these uh, private sector Chinese actors. Okay. So this brings us up to more the moment I want to focus on, which is the food crisis moving forward. And here I just want to uh, kind of show you how this influenced Chinese aid, and just for comparative purposes, I think kind of mention what the U.S. is doing as well. Okay, so um, I'll talk about the food crisis in just a minute, but with increasing global food crisis, increasing volatility of global food markets, um, I think there's this increasing recognition that China not only needs to source food from overseas, but it needs to do so in a stable way that is not as uh, open to kind of global market uh, variability, okay? You see this rhetoric, okay, about how Africa is a sparsely populated place. It's underpopulated. I don't necessarily disagree with that. Um, and, and this argument that it's very land rich, okay? So there's a lot of potential in Africa, okay? So, um, and, and key in the kind of focus here are, are these public-private partnerships and the pushing of a green revolution approach, okay? In some instances, China is engaging in long-term leases of African farmland, okay, so-called land grabs, um, which are really about export-oriented food production, okay? Food production that is gonna come back to, to China, okay? Um, this is mainly going on in southern Africa. Mozambique, Tanzania, Malawi, Angola are sites of these, of these long-term leases. Okay? The other kind of pillar of Chinese aid is, is, is about infrastructure developments, particularly in those countries that have mineral resources that the Chinese are very interested in. Okay? So concurrent with this, what's going on with USA? Okay? And I think there are some important nuances and differences here and some interesting similarities, okay? Um, USAID, uh, the major kind of bilateral assistance arm of the U.S. government, had a declining interest in agriculture over probably a 20 to 30 year period, okay? So after 2007-2008, uh, all of a sudden we see a resurgence of an interest in agriculture, okay? Um, and, you know, there's this focus on food self-sufficiency again in a way that hadn't really been there since the 1970s. How do we increase food production in the African continent? But very interestingly, it's not, you know, the Chinese, it's how do we increase food production, not just for Africans, but for our own consumption. That's not the U.S. concern. The U.S. concern is really colored by uh, our interest in security and our kind of global anti-terrorism uh, uh, concerns. And there's this, this deep belief that food insecurity leads to social unrest and it can foment uh, you know, terrorism. So that's, that's, that's part of the kind of US interest in food security, okay? So um, big support for another green revolution in Africa uh, as um, uh, AGRA, a, a nonprofit, is, is very active in this area gets a lot of support from um, the Gates Foundation. And where I work in West Africa, there's a particular focus on rice, 
okay? And a particular variety known as Nerica rice, which is a cross between Asian and African rice varieties. And I'm <coughs> going to come back to, to Nerica rice, okay? So very quickly, I just want to kind of sketch out this uh, important moment, okay? Um, the 2008 global food crisis, okay? Um, so, you know, we went through a period of low food prices in uh, the, the 80s and 90s, but food prices begin to gradually increase from 2000, okay? 2007 to 2008, average food prices increased by about 50%. For some commodities like rice, they increased 100%, okay? So this, you know, is of concern to the Chinese, okay? Um, how are they going to access food at a reasonable price? It's like I said, of concern to the Americans because of security concerns. Food prices <coughs> did go back down after 2008, but they've come back up in 2011, okay? But it's a different set of commodities than we saw in, in 2008. And this is just a longer term view of food prices adjusted for inflation. So you have your nominal food prices, but the real food prices, if you adjust for inflation, you will notice that this is not the highest global food prices have ever been, okay? So if we go back to an earlier period in the 70s and the 60s, they, were, they, they got as high uh, then as, as they are now, okay? But high food prices are a particular problem for the urban poor, okay? This is a big generalization, but typically the urban poor, in, in comparison to their rural counterparts, don't produce as much of their own food. They're more dependent on the market and a large proportion of their incomes are spent on food. Um, so, you know, one of the key indicators for food insecurity in the urban context is the price, the price of food. So, when global food prices went up, this spawned a lot of social unrest around the world, much but not all of it in the global south. Um, and there's a particular concentration uh, in West African coastal cities, um, which by the time this happens, are heavily dependent on imported rice, mostly, not exclusively, but mostly from Asian producers. So rice went up 100% in this time. So it leads to so-called food riots, okay? Um, I am guilty of deploying this term um, food riots, but I have increasingly become uneasy with the notion of a food riot um, because I think it implies that there's spontaneous violence. Okay. that um, you know, we kind of have this image of animals fighting over scraps of food in a period of scarcity, and I don't really think that's an accurate description of what was going on. I think in a lot of these coastal West African cities, demonstrators are unhappy with their governments. They're trying to draw their government's attention to the vulnerability of the urban poor. They're dissatisfied with a set of government policies which led to this particular moment. And I think that's really different than the kind of food riot image that, that we often have in our, in our country. So now I'm, I'm going to focus specifically on Mali. And I'll be frank, it's because I know this place well. It's a, a place I've been in and out of for the past uh, 25 years, um, which allows me to kind of look more in depth at what happened there. Okay? So, um, and how this Chinese Green Revolution narrative influenced the response, okay? So, interestingly, Bamako, Mali, the capital city, did not experience food riots, okay? But the Malian government was extremely nervous in 2007, 2008, okay? So, um, Mali did ban exports of grains, okay? So you did have an issue where you had a lot of traders from coastal countries who are coming in and they're trying to buy up grain in Mali, okay? And, and the government was very concerned about that. I don't think it really stopped it, okay? People were paying bribes at the borders to get the grain out. But you could argue that that is a de facto export tariff, okay? So it probably did slow down the exodus of grain, okay? The other thing that they did is they completely removed import tariffs. So Import tariffs on food had been reduced during the structural adjustment years. There were small tariffs left, and then those were completely, completely removed, okay? In addition to this, there were other ways, longer-term strategies for, for responding. And I want to talk about 
two of these. Okay? And the first of these, um, the Chinese are not directly involved okay, in the Nurika Rice Initiative. Um, but I think their example inspired this, and it's actually the Americans that are more heavily involved in this, this first uh, response. Okay? So um, this is a map of Mali. This is showing you where um, most of the intensive rice production occurs in this purple area. This is where most of the capital city's rice production comes from. But in the southern part of the, of, of the country, which historically is the breadbasket of West Africa, you are growing sorghum, millet, maize, groundnuts, okay? Um, and it's a food surplus area, and the big cash crop is, is cotton. Okay? Um, and the Prime Minister of Mali in 2008, um, because of this concern about uh, global food prices, launches a massive uh, initiative to um, plant Nurika rice in the southern part of the country. Okay? So um, this is just an image of typical landscape in southern Mali. Okay? You have seasonally flooded areas that are in the, in the lower line areas where traditionally women, and it was, rice was a women's crop, women would grow rice, okay? But in the gentle slopes, the upland areas, you <coughs> would grow sorghum, millet, maize, and cotton, and peanuts, okay? This is a topo sequence. It's a profile of the landscape. I apologize for the indigenous soil types, but I'm just trying to give you a sense of how rice was grown in the lower areas. And uh, you have these other crops which are grown on the slopes, okay? Um, not much surplus rice is grown in southern Mali. Women grow it, and it's, it's a kind of a, it's a, it's a, it's a special crop for weddings, for celebrations, okay? The major food crop in these areas, like I said, are these other coarse grains. What the prime minister wanted to do was convert a lot of these sorghum and millet fields to rice production, upland, dryland rice production. So he launches this huge initiative in the spring of 20, uh, 2008, uh, February, March, April, this period. Everybody, according to the interviews I did in the agricultural ministry, are pointing out that this is highly problematic. Okay? They don't have the Nerika rice seeds. They don't have the inputs, okay? uh, the, the, the fertilizers and the pesticides that you need to do this. But the prime minister, who's angling to be the next president of Mali, and we're having an election in this spring of 2012, is really staking his political fortunes on this initiative. Okay? So the extension folks go out, they disseminate seeds, they disseminate inputs, and they work with men. Okay, so they want men to grow rice, and rice is a female crop in this part of Mali. Okay? They end this campaign, okay, and it's, 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 it's declared an amazing success. Okay? Um, and from all I can tell from the interviews I did, so no government minister, uh, people in the government on record would say that it was a failure. But oftentimes, you'd do an interview, you'd walk outside, and then you'd get a second story of what happened. <laughs> and so off the record, as well as based on observations that I did in the rural areas, it was a massive failure. Okay? So how can you report a great success when it was a massive failure? Well, two things happened. They did have a bumper crop up in this rice growing area up here, the traditional export-oriented rice growing area. So you had a big crop, and part of that's attributed to the South. The other thing that happened is when the extension staff went out, they picked the best farmer in each village who had the highest yields, and then they extrapolated those yield results to everybody that, that grew rice. So as one of my ag economist friends has told me, if indeed this was the success they claimed it to be, then there are some secret grain elevators out there somewhere that hold all this rice that was, that was supposedly produced. But the thing to keep in mind is that this was important internally politically. The prime minister needed this to be a success to ensure that he would be a viable candidate in the presidential election. But also externally, okay, um, Narika Rice in uh, 
agronomy circles is the next greatest thing. It's the silver bullet that is going to save West Africa from the food crisis. So I think um, there was a lot of interest externally in this being a success. Okay, and um, the, the Extension Service and USAID and some other prominent actors were, were quite involved with this. Okay. So second example that I want to um, focus on a bit, okay? Um, and this is in this major rice producing area, um, which is north of Segu. I don't know if any of you here have spent much time in West Africa. Um, but this area is called the Office du Niger. And it has a very interesting history, okay? Which dates back to the French colonial period. So um, the French were very keen, okay? in the 1920s to replicate what had happened with cotton production in Egypt. Okay? So they wanted to have um, irrigated cotton production. So um, they built a, a dam just downstream some, from Segu in a town called um, Markala. And they diverted water out of the Niger River into a series of perimeters. Okay? Um, they initially focused on cotton. It was a massive fa failure, basically because it was economically unsustainable. The costs of producing cotton were so high that it could not be sustained. So they very quickly switch over to rice. Okay. Um, this particular scheme was built at great human cost. Okay. They didn't, there weren't enough local people to construct the dam and the rice perimeters, so they brought in a lot of labor from um, Burkina Faso. Um, who subsequently stayed, okay? But there was, um, it was forced labor, there was pretty significant loss of life. Um, and, and from an ecological standpoint, you were taking about 70% of the flow out of the river, um, which creates huge problems downstream for an inland um, delta area known as the um, inland Niger uh, River Delta. Um, so, you know, you gain this production within this irrigation scheme, but then you lost production downstream, which was the traditional rice producing area. Okay. So, in 2008, the uh, Malian government signs a deal with the Libyan government. A 50 year lease of 1,000, 100,000 hectares within this office du Niger. So this is the area we're talking about. This is that inland delta that I talked about. This is where the dam is, where you're diverting water up into these areas. This is a blow up of this. And this is the, the, the um, project we're talking about. So it was a Libyan sovereign wealth fund. Okay? We don't know how much money was exchanged, but it's a 50 year lease for that land. These, these are two other projects um, uh, north of there, but that these are more kind of traditional development projects focused on increasing rice production, but more for domestic consumption, okay? This project is about producing rice for export, okay? So it's a Libyan sovereign wealth fund, but the implementers of the project are two Chinese firms, okay? So like I had mentioned previously, China is very active in Mali on a lot of construction projects they have a tea production project, they have a sugar production project, but along with this have come all these Chinese private sector operators, and they then become the implementers for other types of development projects. So um, the, um, the, there's a Chinese firm that's building the infrastructure, and then there's a Chinese firm that's bringing in the improved seeds and training people how to produce uh, rice using this particular package, this Green Revolution approach to, to improve uh, food production. Okay. Um, in order to kind of revitalize and increase production in this area, roads were built and one of the largest canals was built in Sub-Saharan Africa. So it's about 30 meters wide, it's 40 kilometers long, so it's an extension, another canal off of this Office du Niger project. Um, in the process of building the canal, there are a couple of issues that come up. 
okay? One is that there were communities in the way, so they needed to be moved. But also, this is an area of intensive animal husbandry. So when you build this canal, you interrupt the, the pathways of that, that, that um, transhuman pastoralists uh, normally move. Um, and then there's the big issue of diverting water. So remember, we're already diverting 70% of the Niger River's water, and now we're going to divert even more. And this has serious consequences. This is a blow up of this area downstream, the inland Niger Delta. So this traditionally is where rice was produced in Mali. Um, this is, there's a lot of good scholarship that, that suggests that this is where African rice was initially domesticated. There are two major kinds of rice in the world, African and Asian rice, okay? So this has a long history of rice production, and it's also a site of incredible um, agrodiversity, uh, agrobiodiversity in terms of different types of, of rice varieties. They also practice recessional agriculture. So, you know, the floods come in around June, uh, the water level starts to go up, it starts receding in, in December, and as that water recedes, you can plant on the residual moisture as the river recedes, okay? Also, as the river recedes, there's a plant known as borgu, which is prime f uh, fodder for animals. So in the dry season, there's a, there's a, a, a pastoral that's come into this area, they graze their cattle, and then they'll also they'll leave this area when, when the rains return. So this whole set of kind of fishing and agriculture and, and, and pastoral livelihoods is being threatened by increasing diversion of water um, uh, upstream from this site. So you may be wondering, and I have wondered intensely, what's going to happen to this project since Gaddafi is no longer in control of Libya and he's in hiding. And the best thing I can tell is that the agreement was signed with the Libyan government. It was not signed with Gaddafi. So um, it, it simply transfers, okay? So this is still a part of the Libyan portfolio and the food is still destined for uh, Libyan markets. Now what's interesting is the way this particular project has been sold to the Malian people. And it's very much about improving food self-sufficiency, um, getting infrastructure investments, and teaching how people how to use so-called modern agricultural practices. So this is a quote from the Malian agricultural minister. Our concern today is to modernize agriculture, especially rice cultivation. To do this, we need a lot of resources and a lot of land. We cannot give a a tractor to a small producer who would use it on two or three hectares. That would be a waste. So large-scale agriculture, a big emphasis on, you know, you need resources to build this infrastructure to improve rice. And these Chinese firms are, you know, involved in this, in this implementing this particular approach. So I want to end by um, revisiting the question that I originally posed, does the Chinese Green Revolution narrative provide useful policy suggestions for African agricultural development? Is this a model that African countries should follow? Okay. My concern here is that we're getting a sanitized version of the history of what happened in the Chinese context. And it reminds me so much of the way structural adjustment was sold in the African context. So if you've studied structural adjustment, you may know that what the World Bank did is it pointed to the examples of the NICS, the newly industrialized countries in East Asia. And it said this spectacular rise in development was due to a certain set of free market policies. And it kind of uh, varnished over the fact that there was a heavy state involvement in actually making that happen. Okay, so my concern is that in a sense we're seeing a repeat of this, that we're getting a distorted and simplified version of what, of what happened uh, in China. Uh, and now this is being used to produce, to push a particular agenda in, in the African context. Okay, um, my concern is that this approach is benefiting outsiders more than it is Africans. I think it's beneficial to the Chinese because it's, it's pushing for an export-oriented form of agriculture, um, and increasingly that's something that China needs, okay? As it becomes more 
industrialized, it, it will no longer be self-sufficient in food production. So it needs other export-oriented food producers. In a similar way, I think this is beneficial to the United States because we have an agro-industrial complex, uh, agrochemical firms that produce inputs that will be used by these African producers. So from a business perspective, it, it's, it's, it's useful to us as well. So in contrast to that, you know, I look at China perhaps as a lesson what not to do, okay? It went down a particular road, okay? It worked for a time. We've seen that um, production has now plateaued, okay? Um, and maybe, you know, another way of looking at this African example is to, you know, look more carefully at that experience and see if it's really appropriate uh, for Sub-Saharan Africa and perhaps re-explore that biointensive path that the Chinese were initially on, but then subsequently abandoned when it adopted the, the, the Green Revolution approach. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bill. We have a fair amount of time for questions and discussion, so I'm going to let Bill field questions. I know there are lots. Sure. Um, let's, uh, let's suppose that um, I mean, it is true that China is in a situation where it needs food coming in, mm -hmm. right? Because of the changes between their country and the mm -hmm. So they're in a situation where we need to have food, okay? So why is it of more benefit to them to go, say, to Africa to, you know, develop these this way of, you know, having this importable food mm -hmm. versus looking at their own country, which is huge, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, working within the producer. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, that's the piece that I'm, I'm thinking, I get it, mm -hmm. and I believe it, that, and I, you know, I also believe that going down this route of the Green Revolution for Africa is going to be very troublesome. Mm -hmm. But I don't get that piece. What's its advantage for China? Can I also ask people as they're asking questions to introduce themselves? Because we have oh. kind of a big and diverse crowd here today. I'm Katie Lust, uh, Director of Research, Boynton Health Service. Thank you so much. So that's a really good question. And I'm not sure if I'm fully equipped to answer it properly. Um, because um, I'm a novice in terms of China's agricultural scene. My best guess. Is, is that it's two issues. One is, um, in a sense, they're, they're pretty tapped out. They, they, uh, they had this big push to increase yields, okay, and now they're, 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 they're suffering the consequences in terms of soil degradation, and that's really difficult to reverse once, once you start experiencing that level of, of degradation. I suspect the other piece of it is just an increasing trend towards um, uh, industrialization and urbanization and the redeployment of labor away from agriculture. Yeah. Um, Don Johnson, a retired librarian. Um, I have a two-pronged type of question. Mm -hmm. You mentioned in China the plateau in the production of materials, mm -hmm. and that urbanization was one of the great driving forces for the new demand for food. Mm -hmm. um, I believe most studies tend to indicate that with greater prosperity, people are going away from the cereal grains, mm -hmm. and they're adopting other foods, particularly meat. Yeah. So what effect is that on the lovely statement that you made? But the other thing that I'm curious about is in Mali, how much urbanization is there? And I mean, is there any relationship to the, the drive, the need for more food production if you're not having that much urbanization? Mm -hmm. So um, first part of your question, you're absolutely right. Okay, the increase in demand uh, for, for food and food consumption is not so much related to 
population growth, but it is directly tied to urbanization. So as people move to urban areas, their diets change, they consume more meat, and you need this grain to produce the, 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 the meat that people increasingly want to consume. So I think that's, um, that is a big driver behind this, coupled with you know, losing land to um, urbanization and, and taking people out of the, 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 the rural labor force. But are they going to be feeding the animals wheat and rice? Um, I mean, that's pretty expensive grain. Well, in order to practice um, kind of free-range animal husbandry, you need space. Um, so as animal husbandry intensifies, you wouldn't feed them uh, grain and rice, but you'd likely be feeding them corn. In order to Which do does grow on your They do grow well. corn in China as well. Yeah. Um, so you're, you're right. I mean, I, the, the, this, this, <laughs> that's, that's an issue. I think um, in the West, a lot of alarm bells have been raised about this. Lester Brown at the World Watch Institute has written a lot about this. I'm, I'm kind of leery of those scare tactics. You know, I, um, um, but, but there is this trend that's related to urbanization. In Mali, very interestingly, the capital city, Bamako, is one of the most, the fastest urbanizing places on the planet. It, it, it is amongst the top 10 cities in the world in terms of growth, not in terms of size. It, on a global scale, it's not a particularly large city. It's, it's, um, it's on the order of 1.5 million people. Um, but it is urbanizing very quickly. Um, I think what's interesting is that um, the push factors behind that urbanization in Mali have been much stronger than the pull factors. So it's not so much that there are a lot of jobs in the capital, um, but that um, I think due to an interesting set of, of kind of neoliberal policies, this has put a, it has made rural livelihoods less viable. And there's also been a lot of investment in the city, and you could argue that maybe that's contributing to some of this. Um, so um, you know, it is a rapidly growing city, but still, okay, 70% of the population is rural. Okay? So, and in, for Sub-Saharan Africa as a whole, it is still the most, it's one of the most rural places in the world, but it's also one of the most quickly urbanizing. So there's, there's a lot of change happening. In the back, yeah. Hi, um, my name is Min Wei. I'm a graduate student mm -hmm. in America Studies. Mm -hmm. um, and my research interests are um, around this relationship between U.S. imperialism and mm -hmm. Africa and China. Mm -hmm. And um, like, what is the United States stake in yeah. this? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, my frame of reference is largely um, the, the Tizara Rail, Railway project. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I'm curious, so from that I understand that the Chinese um, prided itself in having a very different development model than mm -hmm. the U.S., this mm -hmm. more friendship model, and it was a very labor-intensive model. Mm -hmm. They didn't have as much capital. Mm -hmm. And now it seems like the development projects are more capital-heavy, and I'm wondering, well, it, is it more capital-heavy? Like, what is the role of labor? In the, in current development. So this is a really interesting question. And, and I only know the Tazara Railway Project through Jamie Munson's book um, about that. She's a historian at McAllister. But if I can speak to my own experience in, in Mali, I was a Peace Corps volunteer there in um, the 80s. And you know, China had development projects at that time. And what I distinctly remember is how labor intensive they were. So the Chinese would come in and they would be putting a, like a borehole in a rural village and literally you'd have 30 Chinese there working on this project. So they weren't, they were using some local labor but they were using a lot of, a lot of Chinese labor. Um, I do think that's shifted now and this is just casual observation of these large infrastructure projects that I observed in, in 2009 in, in, in Mali. So these are um, private firms, um, Chinese firms, 
And the, the skilled labor, the, the foremen, the engineers are Chinese, but all the manual labor is, is local. Um, um, but it's, 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 it's a different approach than I observed 25 years previously. Um, and I do agree, I think it's, it's um, while there's still a significant labor component like you would have with any type of construction project, it is more capital intensive. <coughs> We're using big machinery like we would see any place else in the world for those projects. And that, you didn't see that as much before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, my name is Jim Ward. I'm from a broadening plant genetics. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a question dealing with uh, the issue of water. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that um, a lot of the plateau of production in China has to do with the fact that they've tapped out a lot of their major sources of water. And of mm -hmm. course, more of it is being diverted to mm -hmm. the, uh, the urban areas. And I was very interested in your comment about the fact that this uh, irrigation scheme is going to take the majority of the water from the river uh, for food production. And then you commented that the capital has a very high rate of growth. And with that, of course, you need more water for the capital city. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what the uh, conflict you see uh, coming between sort of the agricultural production and the need of the urban area for water and how that may influence the success, so to yeah. speak, of this, uh, yeah. this project. So um, <coughs> just geographically, the capital city is upstream of this dam, not downstream. So. The Bamako is using whatever water it needs before it ever gets to this particular dam. Um, but Mali does have three very large dams, and they're in the process of constructing a fourth. Um, and the two primary reasons for constructing dams are both agriculture, but also um, hydroelectric power generation. And, you know, I think. Mali has enough surface water and um, groundwater resources to satisfy its urban population. I, in some ways, I think the, the bigger issue is energy needs and how that's driving dam construction and how that can disrupt. Well, it promotes one type of agriculture and disfavors another. But really, really good question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, my name is Margaret. I'm mm -hmm. a farmer with a background. Mm -hmm. interest is in sustainable food production. Mm -hmm. um, and my question is about your final conclusion up there that Africa should learn from China and choose the biointensive route. I'm wondering uh, if you could elaborate on what you mean by the biointensive route mm -hmm. and also what specific steps you think should be taken or could be taken to move in that direction, who should be in charge, and how feasible you think that is. Sure. Um, so, before I answer that, my major, I need to tell you why I'm concerned about the new green revolution approach and why I think that's less viable. And it, for me, it really has to do with two things. First of all, um, if your ultimate goal is to prevent hunger, so you want food to get to the poorest of the poor, the poorest of the poor don't have the means to access the the particular set of new green revolution technologies. So you have to, on credit, buy seeds, pesticides, and fertilizers. Um, and um, maybe you could afford it one year, or you could take out credit to get them. But the, the, you know, agricultural production is so variable in Mali that it's really easy to get in one of these kind of debt credit traps. Um, so I think that's problematic for the poorest of the poor. But also, it's an energy intensive approach to agricultural production. And my concern is that, um, you know, we know with some certainty that global energy prices are going to go up. I mean, they may fluctuate, but they're going to go up. And to encourage um, countries to get into very energy intensive agricultural production, I think, is problematic. Um, so, you know, what are the alternatives? Um, you know, my limited understanding is that um, 
the, the Chinese were actively exploring this biointensive approach at one point in time. Um, and then it was abandoned. <coughs> but it's an approach that um, is very uh, focused on plant interactions. So, you know, if you mix legumes and grains, they can facilitate the growth of one another through fixing things like nitrogen. Or if you use polycultures, it reduces uh, insect problems, so then you don't have to use as many uh, pesticides. Um, it's an approach which probably became most evolved in Cuba because they were forced to deal with that problem because of, you know, they were no longer a patron of the Soviet Union and the U.S. was had an embargo on them, so we saw a lot of progress on that particular front. Um, so there is, in the scientific literature, there's this argument from a certain quarter that, 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 that you can never be as productive following this agroecological <laughs> route. There's another group of scholars who are arguing that it could be close to almost as productive and in many ways more efficient because you don't have to input all this energy to get, to get this kind of output. So how do you, what do you propose for, for doing that? I think you need uh, government support and scientific establishment that's going to that's gonna support that kind of approach. I mean, working very closely with local people, trying to, uh, you know, build on indigenous systems and improve them. But we don't, the extension service in every African country I've seen, and I've worked closely in six African countries, tend to be heavily in favor of a green revolution approach. And this is not a new thing. I mean, this dates back to the 1960s and 70s when most African countries had a policy of food self-sufficiency. That gets abandoned after structural adjustment, and now we're seeing the return of that. In the back, yeah. Um, uh, my name is Alejo, and I'm at Humphreys mm -hmm. uh, School of Public Affairs, and I'm from Togo, mm -hmm. South Africa. Um, Bienvenue. Merci. <laughs> I, my question is, um, you just said that government in Africa are not in favor of this kind of thing, they more they want a green mm -hmm. revolution approach. Mm -hmm. So, is there do do we still do we keep showing them this kind of approach, or do we go to the local people and educate them so they can pressure the government to do that kind of change? Because I feel like most local people don't know about this kind of um, research and. They don't, they don't understand or they don't know and no one is telling them mm -hmm. why this and why that. So instead of talking to the government all the time, why don't we empower the people and tell the people so they can influence the government to make the right decision? Yeah. It's just a question. Yeah. No, it's an excellent question. Um, I guess I favor kind of a nuanced hybrid approach. How can you use local insights and combine them with outside expertise to come up with a hybrid, better solution. Um, and I think the problem is that agricultural extension in most African countries, in, as well as in the United States, okay, has, um, it was different in the progressive era, but in, in the recent times has been about disseminating technologies. So. You know, someone comes, someone in a lab decides that this is the problem, comes up with the solution, and then teaches people how to do it, okay? So, for example, in southern Mali, um, the big cash crop is cotton. So you have an agricultural extension service which um, goes out, has very pejorative opinions of peasants, um, tells them that they're stupid and ignorant, and, and they say that, okay? And, and, and argue that you need to use this kind of modern approach to growing cotton, and your, you know, your intercropping practices, your local food crops are backward and primitive and have low yields. Um, so it's all about introducing this new approach. And I wish, I wish agricultural extension could often work in reverse. 
So, you know, local people have a set of strategies. Certainly they encounter problems and bottlenecks. If they could communicate those to uh, the agricultural service and, the, and the, the research centers in their country, and then they work on those problems and come back. So it's this dialogue to solve these problems. But that's, it's kind of, we need to reverse engineer that process and, and that, it, it doesn't happen that way. In the far back. Yeah. Uh, I'm Paul from chemistry. Mm -hmm. so, uh, uh, so could you comment on the similarity and the differences of the Green Revolution in the US and uh, China? Uh, so because the, uh, the Green Revolution initiated in the US or in the University of Minnesota mm -hmm. uh, greatly improved the agriculture in Mexico and also India. Mm -hmm. so, so what can we learn from these successful stories? And also, uh, what's your opinion? So which kind of mode, the mode in the uh, US or in China, which mode can be more beneficial for the American countries? So, I, it's a really good question, and I, and I don't think the Green Revolution was not only problematic in China, from my perspective, but it was problematic in other areas of the world it was implemented. So, you know, in South Asia and Southeast Asia, it, it, you know, it does lead to increasing yields, this is true, but at what ecological and social cost? So. In many instances, it was the wealthier households that could afford these technologies. It, it increases stratification in, in rural societies. The, the wealthier farmers get wealthier. They leave the poor farmers behind. In many instances, the poorest farmers start working for the wealthier farmers or lose their land entirely. And then from an ecological perspective, there was a huge problem with pesticide resistance. You know. Pest communities develop resistance to chemicals, and you have to use increasingly high doses to get to get the same result. So I don't. Um, I'm concerned that we didn't learn all the lessons from this first green revolution of the '60s and '70s, and we're potentially replicating those with this new green revolution. And the argument is that the first. Green Revolution didn't really touch uh, the African continent. Um, there are some notable exceptions to that, like Zimbabwe, um, where maize yields increased dramatically. But what's really interesting about the Zimbabwe case, so this is held up, this is the Green Revolution success story in the African continent. Though that increasing productivity was largely amongst large-scale white farmers, okay? Um, and that's kind of wallpapered over. Um, so um, even, you know, it, there, are, there are lots of problems with the first Green Revolution, and, and I wish we, we would take on board all of those issues before we start pushing it again. Mm -hmm. um, hi, I'm Karen. Mm -hmm. I'm at Lando Lakes, which is a cooperative. And um, my question has to do with this issue of foreign direct investment. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that that seems to be a very important element um, that's happened just in the last like five years of, of that foreign countries are coming in and Africa for a very long time was almost considered a flyover continent. I mean, mm -hmm. investment was not coming. Mm -hmm. Now, because of these shortages, where there there's these land grabs with, tri with tribal leaders, mm -hmm. um, you know that issue of the of the Chinese coming in the like you know Libya et cetera. It, for export is affecting food security locally. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, Green Revolution is happening both from these foreigners as well as locally. Mm -hmm. But what is the bigger problem? Is, is, are they both the problem? Or is really the, the thing that's acute right now is the fact that the foreigners are coming in and using that, pro that technology to export but, everything so out of them? The, the main, I think, <laughs> is that um, those long-term leases, those land grabs, the way they're often sold to the, 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 the local population is that this is a way to bring in modern agriculture. So, so even though this is, uh, this is a land grab, we're going to learn from this process and be able to modernize our agriculture. So I, I see that as there's a very direct link there. And the other way I like to think about it is you have other regions of the world which are essentially exporting their food insecurity. 
So right. the, the, you know, you're gonna, you're concerned about market volatility. You don't want your population to be vulnerable. So you obtain a lease in Africa, so you, you circumvent the market essentially, so you can get a reliable source of food that is not as subject to global volatility. Do you, the people that you're working in Mali, do you think they're figuring this out and realizing that it's not the best option for their development um, in more than one way? I mean, including the fact that they're now folks that used to have pastoral elements on that land now don't have access to it and their food security is threatened? So this particular land grab deal with the Libyan government was conducted behind closed doors and it was presented to the public as a fait accompli. I mean, it was a done deal. Um, local people um, are very upset with what happened. Um, and there has been some organization around that. One particular community that was moved when they built this, this canal, not only were 150 people moved, but they, they went through a cemetery and dug up all the, all the remains, and there was a lot of uh, folks who were uh, upset about that. So there is, there is local organizing about this issue. I think oftentimes the government position is it's, well, I'm a geographer, so I think in terms of scale. Okay. So there, there are local scale problems, and those have to be sacrificed for the benefit of the nation, that this is good for national food self-sufficiency or security, even though it may hurt local populations. But I think even that national argument is problematic. Can I ask one follow-up? Sure. So do you think that they are, now that they have this tech, do you think there's any validity to the argument that foreigners can come and provide this technology and, and then the nation is better off? Have you seen an example that that's happened yet? If it's strictly about a green revolution approach, I think that's problematic in the African context. I don't, I don't want to say categorically that's problematic everywhere, right. but I think we need a more nuanced hybrid approach. Because the ownership remains with the foreigners. The well, the ownership of the technology, yeah. and if it's a land lease, the land as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak to looking at the, sorry, Kari Williams, Master of Development mm -hmm. Practice Student at Humphrey. I'm just curious, when you, curious about when you're looking at development projects on a broad scale, not just agricultural, but including things like rural development, when you have 70% of the population is rural. And, uh, and I'm not sure what unemployment in Mali is, but you look at issues of massive unemployment and you're weighing those inputs, um, ecological versus labor intensive. Uh, I guess, how does that all play it? To me, bio-intensive makes sense because you address issues of unemployment, but what does that look like from a governmental perspective, and how do you get people on board with a plan like that? So, um, I'm going to give you a more complex response than you probably want to hear. Perfect. Um, I, before structural adjustment, there was, um, there, there was a problem known as urban bias. Um, so the idea was that um, food prices were being controlled and that this benefited the urban population. Um, and then the idea with structural adjustment is that you were going to let prices float um, and then this would be better for <coughs> rural producers. So in theory, structural adjustment was supposed to be about moving away from that urban bias. The problem was that we also reduced import tar tariffs. So you had all this cheap grain coming in. And in the West African context, sometimes it was American rice, which was highly subsidized, or it was um, Asian rice. And the big exporters are Thailand and Vietnam. And in a way, that cheap Asian rice is a product of the first Green Revolution. That's, that's what made them into major rice exporters. Um, so that, um, that, all this cheap rice crushed domestic production. Plus, you got rid of subsidies for inputs, so that hurt domestic producers as well. Um, but behind all that, so why did they do that, right? So even though structural adjustment was supposed to be about getting rid of urban bias, they still wanted cheap food for the urban consumer. And I think, you know, part of it's 
a particular notion of, you know, a free market economy is best, but also by allowing these cheap imports, it, it, it was good for um, the, the urban population. And so now, in the West African context, I see the persistence of this urban bias because there's all this focus on rice. Why rice? Because that's what the urban consumer wants. And there are lots of interesting reasons why that is. So people are shifting away from coarse grains into rice. Some of it has to do with, you know, women have less time to prepare food and rice is a lot quicker to prepare than, than, than sorghum or maize, okay? So th there's, there's this feeding into it. But um, this obsession with rice, okay, I think well, the issue I have with it is we often think about the urban consumer and we don't think about rural livelihoods. So how do we make rural livelihoods more viable, okay? And, um, you know, the, just focusing on rice production all the time, I don't think is necessarily the way to do that. Um, a classic case of this, and this is not my own work, this is Judy Carney's work. She's a geographer at, at, at UCLA, um, the Gambia, which, it's basically a big swamp along the, uh, the Gambia River, historically was self-sufficient in rice. It's part of the national diet. Yet, you've got a third of the population in Banjul, the capital on the coast, that's almost entirely um, dependent on low-grade broken rice from Asia. Yet, you've got inland two-thirds of the population that could produce surplus rice but it's, it's, a, it's two entirely separate countries. It's like urban Gambia on the coast and rural Gambia, and we're not, we're not connecting those rural livelihoods to, to, to urban consumers. And, and, and for me, that's really key. And, and I think part of the problem is this persistent urban bias, even though we don't you know, call it that anymore. You've had your hand up earlier. So. Um, hi, Mary Voigt. I substitute teach Mandarin around the Twin Cities. My question is, um, while China raised the living standard of its own people, you know, in a, in, a, in a wonderful way, and while the West did colonize large parts of Africa, you know, the French in Cameroon and Algeria, the Germans and the Dutch, um, is what the Chinese are doing in Africa um, in the best interest, is it, is it as noble as they did when they raised the living standards of people in China? Or is it comparable to colonizing Africa the way Westerners did, mm -hmm. just with different names and different nuances? Yeah. I mean, this is a raging debate in African studies circles. Um, and there's a lot of accusations that China is the new kind of imperial power. And that at the end of the day, it's really about resources. Um, and there's a pretty high correlation between Chinese investment and the places that have resources that are attractive to um, China. Of course, this creates a lot of anxiety in the United States because we want those resources too. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of China bashing, which ignores the fact that in many cases we're there for the same reason. Um, now, you could argue that. By having more players in the field, that African countries, if they're savvy about it, can kind of play off these two interests and get the best deal. Okay? I think the Chinese would also argue that they have gone about development in a different way that the, than the Western powers have. I think they would argue that this is South-South cooperation, that they are uh, a developing country and they have a similar experience and that's more relevant to the African context than what the West has to offer. Okay, so then I'm not giving you a direct answer, I'm just telling you the different views that are out there. Yeah. Someone to that end, um, I'm curious, I'm sorry, my name is Robert Sparrow, I'm a graduate student in mm -hmm. nutrition and I study uh, the development of Western dietary practice in mm -hmm. post socialist China. Um, that started with um, research on political ecology of a region called Sichuan Bana, which is the southernmost part, mm -hmm. southwesternmost part of China's uh, Yunnan province. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you've had opportunity to consider China's acquisition and development of that region um, since the 1950s when you consider the sort of trajectory of African development. Yeah. I have not. So, you know, you're, you're, I'm out of my depth. 
with that question. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm an Africanist, mm -hmm. so I haven't studied in depth the, the, this particular, you know, case that you're talking about. But could I, you share? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I, I would recommend it just because there, are, while there are certainly factors that are not analogous, mm -hmm. the specificity of it taking place during the development of the PRC, mm -hmm. the Household Responsibility Act, the Village Township Enterprises, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, all specific to the Chinese situation. Mm -hmm. um, it was part of Thailand up until the 1950s and was basically acquired by China so that it could be converted into mm -hmm. agricultural land, mm -hmm. rubber, okay. pineapple, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. All sort of um, seeding to state level or nationalistic agendas, mm -hmm. much like what you're talking about right now. Okay. So I, I guess I just wanted to bring it up because I do think that in terms of a specific case yeah. in recent Chinese history, um, there are many analogous situations with regards to local knowledge, um, agricultural practice, mm -hmm. water management, border issues, et cetera, et cetera. OK. Now, actually, if you could, we should talk. I'd yes. love to get <laughs> some, you know, some literature on that particular area. We should probably only take one more question. We've had Bill mm -hmm. here for a while. So my name is Xian. I'm, I'm from History of Science. Mm -hmm. uh, in China is that to introduce some foreign knowledge about agricultural sciences mm -hmm. and uh, build up a system, agriculture system for itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, from the 50s to 80s, uh, my understanding is the development of Chinese agriculture was kind of isolated from the outside mm -hmm. and the kind of independent development. Mm -hmm. But for the case of Africa, it seems in the current international system, mm -hmm. it's very hard for them to keep separated from outside. And the, the way of their green revolution seems to be introduce some foreign capitals and the operations. Mm -hmm. So as I said, these were two very different way to develop agriculture. So do you think it was really, do you think it's really possible or necessary for Africa to follow the Chinese way of Yeah. So, um, well, I don't think Africa should follow Chinese example of the Green Revolution, and that's kind of the point of my talk, that, that I think this the example's being held up as an argument for what should happen in Africa, and, 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 and I think that's problematic. But to the other part of your question, you're right. There, so China didn't have the same kind of colonial relationship with the West that many African countries did. So, you know, African economies were reorganized during the colonial period in order to produce commodities that were useful to the core powers. Um, and many people would argue that, you know, structural adjustment was, was neo-imperialism, that we were recreating those same types of relationships, encouraging African countries to be export-oriented and produce things that the global market wanted. Um, so China's in a slightly different situation, but um, to argue that its agricultural technology was completely independent, I do think that changed after China opened up, and, and then there was a lot more sharing of, of technology. But the difference is that I think China was focused on food self-sufficiency rather than producing agricultural products that could be exported to the West in the way Africa has done. So actually, my, <laughs> my, I'm working on a project about how the Chinese scientists studied uh, agricultural science in the US, mm -hmm. then brought those knowledge back to China yeah. and the localized um, those Western knowledge. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, is there this kind of migration of ideas and the knowledge Africa. So you have a lot of um, African scientists who have been educated at Western universities. That definitely happens, um, happened, and is happening. And I do think um, there's still a strong kind of technological bias, a green revolution bias to a lot of African scientists in African research centers and 
ministries of agriculture. And I think that is in part related to their Western education. So I'd like to thank you all for coming and I recognize that there were still a few questions that didn't get answered, so you're welcome to stay. There are also, Bill has graciously offered to go to lunch with those of us who are interested. There are still a few seats at that table, so I know you've just given up an hour and a half of your Friday. If you have a little extra time, you're welcome to join us. And if anyone is not on the Institute for Advanced Studies email list, would like to be. I think there's a sign-up sheet just outside the door. We'll send you an email message about midday every Wednesday about wonderful and exciting events like this one. So please feel free to sign up if you'd like to. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.